On episode 223 of the Tennis Files podcast, you'll learn how to simplify your serve and develop a winning mindset with Karu Sell. Hey there, welcome back to the show. This is Mirban Aranshad, and it is a pleasure to have you back listening. And today I have an interview for you with Karu Sell. And Karu was ranked as high as 371 on the ATP Tour. He also is Naomi Osaka's practice partner. And he has some really cool videos of him hitting with Naomi on his YouTube channel. Uh, just search My Tennis HQ uh, on YouTube.com. And Karu has also had over 100 wins playing college tennis at UCLA. Uh, reaching the NCAA team final. He has also had a career high uh, 15.01 UTR rating, which is very, very high. <laughs> he is Brazilian and he's won several futures tournaments and he's also defeated Dominic Team, Kyle Edmund, and Hugo Delian, I believe, in the juniors. So, very cool to have him on. And we're going to be talking about a lot of very important subjects, including how to simplify your serve and get more power on it, how to develop a winning mindset, every single racket that Carew has used since the juniors, which was uh, pretty cool to hear about, some of his favorite uh, racket modifications, and uh, the mental attitudes that you need to win the most matches, as well as some really cool drills for more serve power, and why he modeled his serve off Pete Sampras and how that helped him immensely as well as the platform versus pinpoint stance on the serve. So obviously, a lot of information. And if you think that's a lot, this is only part one of my interview with Karu. So you'll be hearing from us again next episode. So I do hope that you enjoy this one and then immediately, or you know, as soon as it's available, pivot to part two. Uh, but before we do go on to the interview, I would like to give you my pun of the day, which I'm sure you're very apprehensively waiting for, uh, and I've been continuing it on for, I guess, the past like five or six episodes, maybe more, but here it goes. I once played a guy with two sets of arms, and that's why I wasn't surprised that he had such an amazing forehand. Two sets of arms, forehand. All right, well, I hope you got that one, uh, and yes. Hope you really enjoyed it. You probably didn't, but that's okay. It's good to be a little silly sometimes with uh, these dad jokes or puns, as they call them. All right. Well, with that fantastic joke, if I do say so myself, let's leap straight into my interview. So here it is. Here's my interview with Karu Sell. Everybody, welcome to another episode of the Tennis Falls podcast. It's really an honor and a pleasure to have with me Karu Sell, who is an awesome tennis player and has an awesome YouTube channel, which I've been following and have really been enjoying just, just watching him hit pure balls. You know, he's, he has <laughs> such great strokes. And as I said in the intro, you know, he's had a lot of experience on the Pro Tour and been ranked, you know, quite high. And so it's always great to speak with players who have achieved, you know, the elite levels of the sport. So, Crew, thanks a lot for coming on to the show and welcome. Of course, thanks for having me. This this should be fun. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I'm really excited to get into it. So, first off, I was reading your your bio and uh, you know your website and trying to do some research for this uh, interview. But um, one interesting thing that I saw is, that you listed there is that you had visited Pete Sampras's house, and it seems like that uh, is pretty important to you. You know, you put it in your bio. So, can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, for a couple summers there, like while I was at UCLA, I just, Pete was training for like some of the exhibitions that, that he was playing at the time. And, you know, his, his sister Stella is, is the, the UCLA women's head coach. So right. he's, he's often at, at UCLA and, you know, a lot of, I, he actually used to hit with a lot of the girls. I just found myself uh, hitting with him a few times a week. And then eventually, I think at first we were doing on clay, and then eventually we just sort of started hitting at his house, which was, uh, you know, really, really cool. It has an, an awesome, awesome chord that he would blast. Like, weirdly, he would blast, like, hip-hop while we were playing. And, <laughs> oh, wow. And like a, and it, yeah, I know. You wouldn't expect it. And it was, like, a really good vibe. And we would play for, you know, he was still, you know, obviously playing playing really well. So, yeah, that was, like, a really, really 
it was a really fun thing. Like you grew up obviously watching watching him and you know at the time when you know Guga was playing, you know, there was like you know, a lot of good matches between between them and Agassi as well. So it was like a very, very almost like weird scenario there. I was like, Oh, I'm now hitting with this guy <laughs> here in LA. <laughs> but yeah. it was pretty cool. That's pretty sick. Is there a particular part of his game that impressed you when you hit with him? I mean, obviously his serve is, it, I mean, he, he wasn't really going full out on his serve, but I mean, he's still really, really good. And he's just in general, his ball is like really heavy. Like, like he hits your racket and you feel it. Um, so that, that, that's really, I mean, his forehand still like moves through the core. I think he might be playing like with like a Babola or something now. Oh wow! Um, hmm. Yeah, but he just goes so like it, you know. It's he he can still rip it like he can hit winners like kind of anywhere on the court really. That's very interesting. Is there any piece of advice or anything um, interesting that he told you that actually ended up helping you or any anything maybe that you observed on your own? I think um, he never. T- we usually talked a lot more about golf um, than <laughs> than tennis, but I do. <laughs> Funny thing, like on my serve, one time I was, this is probably like a couple of years ago, I was like just doing like a impersonation like of his serve uh, <laughs> yeah, just yeah. for a video. Yeah, right. And then when I saw the video, I was like, wait, this is, this motion is like way better than mine. It's like way more fluid than mine. <laughs> uh, and then after that, I just started like kind of doing the Pete Stampers, you know, like kind of wreck it here in front. Yeah, yeah, like, toe up. And yeah. it just like it smoothed out my, my serve like tremendously. Like I, I kept doing it ever since. So and obviously his serve is like, you know, all time, you know, probably top three ever. And and I was like, why wasn't I doing this? Like when I was in college <laughs> or something. Just copy uh, the pros, yeah, man. <laughs> I know. Just, I mean, you're a like, pro. I was, so. I, 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 love it. I was a little bit too late for it. You know, I wasn't even like doing it when I was, when I was playing pro. So uh, I wish I had done that beforehand because like today my serve is like way better than what it was when I was like on tour or in college. So it's kind of funny. Cool. Well, this is actually an easy transition. You know, I was going to talk to you about the serve a little bit uh, later, but what was it about his his motion? Like, is it just like the weight distribution back and forth that helped you or what was it in particular? It's a good question. I, I mean, I always, I grew up trying to do the Fed serve, right? So I was always mm-hmm. like trying to copy his. So I was always a platform server. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, like the the Fed server, it's, I think it's a little bit more difficult. So as I was doing his, I think there was definitely like the rocking back and forth is nice. There's a, a there's kind of like a a momentum that goes into it. I'm not necessarily like a guy who has tons of power. And just even like rack head speed, like my 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 power comes from good timing, and that just sort of helped me like with fluidity. I feel like my the swing, the entire swing is just very fluid, and by the time I get to the ball, I'm at a very high contact point, and I'm just really blasting through it, but without feeling like I'm I'm overdoing it in terms of power, in terms of like adding too much power that I feel like I'd lose maybe the the fluidity or contact point wouldn't be as great or whatever. Maybe I'd muscle it. So I'm able to just sort of in a very fluid way, like hit the ball very clean um, and it just kind of moves very naturally. So, yeah, I just I just found it to be a more, much more repeatable motion. Sweet. And, and so as far as like pinpoint and platform, just curious, like, have you uh, experimented with, with those stances throughout your career? I've done pinpoint for a little bit. Uh, it, it's not for me. I... I am particularly more in the, in the, into the platform serving for most mm-hmm. people. Uh, I think it kind of eliminates like movements that, you know, can be, can make serving even more complicated. Right. Um, I, you know, I think it's platform serves are a bit easier for um, one second serves. I think kick serves are easier off a platform serve, at least in my experience. And then two, I think, if you are not as tall, I think it's much easier off a platform serve to like use both legs, get up and hit the ball a bit at a higher contact mm. point where I think like the, the pinpoint serve, like you do more slide into the court. So you have a lot of momentum. I think it's good for first serves, but like, I, I feel like the tall guy, it's better for tall guys because you don't really need to get much height. You actually just want to get that the body kind of through it. So I, I particularly think for most people, you know, 
that are, are in like six, three or four and above, I think um, platform serve is a little bit less complicated. And I think it's just easier, especially on second serves. I think, I think a lot of, I think a lot of female players should be doing more platform serves. I think they all like slide and they'd have a hard time hitting kicks. They're mm-hmm. always sort of slicing the serve a bit more. Um, right. I think off the off the platform serve, I think they they would actually do a better job with that. They're, but there's very few girls that do it, so um, I don't know. I I just find it to be a, a much easier motion, um, and I can use my my legs a lot more. I I think so. Yeah, that's a, a lot of great things to consider there with with the stances. I mean, yeah, thinking about platform versus pinpoint. I think uh, yeah, you think of like Isner and Query, like they're really tall guys yeah. using the pinpoint, yeah. and then like I think you know like Erotic was like kind of a modified platform, like yeah. it was just narrow. Yeah. Um, what yeah. do you think about that, by the way? Like the narrow um platform, what benefits? I don't is mind that? it. I, yeah. I don't. I don't mind it. I mean, I, I just think if you're like. It, you just kind of have to do what is natural to you, but yeah, the the, the rotic, I mean, it's it's kind of its own thing. Like I think very few people have, yeah. have done it. <laughs> I don't think it, you you should be very close together. I think like Monfils was doing it for a little while. Very yes, close. um, I think it has to be like a little in between there. There's got to be some separation. Um, but just in general, I I, I just find it to be just a just an easier serve. Gotcha. Cool, Curtis. So uh, one more question about that before we uh, dive into your career, which is an interesting one as well. But um, you got any tips for us on getting more racket head speed? Uh, it seems like uh, a lot of players, they, they have like issues with like the racket drop and they're just not getting quite that racket head speed, which is obviously, you know, key to uh, getting more power and spin, etc. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll be honest, like serving for me, was always really difficult. Um, I was never really yeah. a big, like a, a good service. I only really started understanding serving, like actually fairly recently. Um, I think the, the, the biggest part is I think people end up like kind of pushing the serve. Like it never yeah. really snaps at the top. They, they end up sort of like going like very pushy through it. Um, a great drill that, you know, I actually learned like while working with Naomi, it's like you, you actually stand, um, on the T like on the T like on the service box, uh-huh. uh, right behind the service box on the serving, like ad side. Um, and you offer like a half motion. So you just kind of place the racket at the top. Uh-huh. You try to like, just sort of smack it down as short as possible on the box and mm-hmm. wide. So like you have to like really snap it up here, like bah. so you try to like really go like fast from up there, and 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 it's all gonna be like this motion up here of like letting the racket drop and accelerate. Um, and I do this, huh. you know, with a lot of my players. I do it myself, and you, you don't really use much of your body. You just use that the arm here and just like kind of snap it down. As again, you want to make the ball really go like bounce up and down uh, and short on the box, and that really has helped me. Um, with like kind of that 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 part of it because you got to be quick from the moment you got to trophy position to like the ball right that like kind of motion up with yeah. like a lot of speed and after that it just sort of goes naturally so that that is a question general like think about hitting like at the highest contact point you can hit you know what i mean i think i think a lot of people let it drop too much and then they sort of have to push it you know, if you place your arm up with the racket and you can see sort of like, oh, this is where I kind of need to be. Um, so I'm just going to toss it and kind of catch it there. You know what I mean? It's like at the, that high, highest contact point. I think if you look for the highest contact point, you'll naturally accelerate a little bit more mm. um, on, on the serve. Sweet. Love that. A lot, a lot of great advice, man. Appreciate it. So let's get into um, your career. Let's actually, you know, get into how you got your start in tennis. I always love hearing about this because you get a lot of, uh, a lot of cool stories and uh, sometimes yeah. emotional ones, but how did you get your start in tennis? Uh, mine isn't too emotional. <laughs> it was just my dad. My dad was, you know, your kind of typical, I think five, five point like to compete, play Solid. In, like tournaments and stuff like that. And, you know, you just, have a racket a little racket on the side and you're playing against the wall kind of thing um but yeah we, we you know my dad used to kind of travel a little bit around um like our state just playing tournaments and now we'll just tag along me and my mom and you know eventually you know you start taking lessons and, and you just snowballs from there right like it's just kind of that typical you know parent parents play and 
you know, my dad is a very active guy, plays a lot of sports. So, you know, everything that I play, I just, we just kind of always did together. So yeah, kind of you know, like, like that. And then all of a sudden you're, you know, you find yourself playing tournaments at like, I don't know, age eight or something. <laughs> <laughs> Anything in particular that hooked you on sport? Any sort of feeling for the game or anything like that that you really, really liked about it? I mean, I think it's a uh, tennis is like you know that is one of those sports like as an individual sport. It's like on your racket, on your terms. Uh, I like I like yeah. I always liked playing team sports as well. Like I played a lot of basketball growing up, but uh, and and soccer, but. You know, there was something about tennis that was just like, it's on your terms, right? And I think, I know that's like a lot of people say that, but it, it is true. It's like, you you do it. And yeah. I think, I mean, at the end of the day, I, I, I was from a young age, I think good at it. And, you know, you start competing and you're, you're winning, you know, from, from a young age. And I think you just, you eventually just get, get hooked to the feeling of actually beating other people and better than them. I mean, you're a kid, you don't really know, but um, <laughs> it's just, it's just a, I think that was a good time. I don't like rem- particularly remember it too much but i just know like you know, from a young age we we're already competing and you know having a good time with that so i i it's just like a, a fun on your terms sport at the end of the day yeah yeah and no, i agree um yeah i remember early days just uh played a bunch of sports and i was just the best of that one and it <laughs> just went yeah. up from there you know i enjoyed the yeah. winning and all that um but um so, uh, a, a kind of random question. Do you remember like your progression of rackets? I'm really curious. And you do like a lot of great racket reviews. Oh, yeah. I think when I emailed you, like, you know, I was telling you, like, I saw your V core reviews and all that. So what, how, yeah. what were the rackets you've, you've been using so far? Oh man, that's a great From question. I first to last. I've always, I've, <laughs> I've always known, like I know players. I'm like the guy that knows what, what everyone is playing with. Like I'll right. notice someone changes rackets. I've always been like that. Yeah. Oh, like they'll say someone. I'm like, oh, he plays with that Babylon. Like, what? I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> like I just remember what the rackets people play. But for me, I played. I remember playing with like when I was young. I remember playing like I, I had a Pro Canix. I think it was wow. my first sort of like normal racket, and then cool. I switched to some weird like Junior Wilson, like some blue Wilson. I remember mm. it wasn't anything great um then i switched to i think by the time i was 10 i switched to this um it was sort of like a i think it was like a, a version of the radical but but again like more i still like more kind of junior very light sure um yeah. so a, a, a version of that and then like i think my first like actual i want this racket and and it was a you know kind of more of a like an actual racket um was uh the end code the wilson end code mm, the, the, yeah. the one that that fed was playing like kind of yeah. his prime the <laughs> the red one so i played with that probably for a couple of years um with the end code and then i think by the time i was 13 14 maybe i made the switch to yonix um and so i went and, and um what is it called? The yellow one, the classic yellow, the Albanian one. Oh, the RDS oh, 001. Like RDS. I played with that too for a few years. 001, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I moved, I, I switched racket. to that. And then there was like a, I remember there was like a, a, another version of it that came out with like some black on it. So I played with that. And then I spent 10 years with, with the Onyx. So every kind of new iteration, I, I was playing with it. So then there was like a red one for a couple of years. Yeah, I played my entire junior career with this like, like red red yonix i can't even remember i have to look at, at, at pictures of it and then by the time i got to ucla i was already at with this like yonix 95 yonix i can't i, I don't remember they always had weird names to like, it like <laughs> but it was like a progression of like you know um pretty much 10 of them um then eventually wow. i i moved to the v core um the the orange one and then again the, the black v core and then after that, they actually switched to. So this is when I was playing pros. I was I was with the V core, and then they switched to, um, like a, a different string pattern that I didn't really like. And they also like mm. weren't like the head kind of came in and like sponsored me for a little bit. So I switched to Prestige cool. and Speed. Played with the Speed for the last few years, um, like a custom version of the Speed. 
and then back to to the decor 95 now but yeah so it was like a good 10 years of just playing with yonix really but the gotcha. encode was like the, the the first like real racket i had i was like oh i'm playing with the same racket as Feather. yeah yeah it's always a cool feeling um they yeah. sell so many rackets that way um yeah, but <laughs> it's crazy so yeah i'm definitely getting a little off track uh from my like planned itinerary i don't know if that's oh, really? the right word but but like um what percentage of players um in your do you think like play with this the racket that they're actually like selling versus um like pro stock or some other you know very old version mm, i don't know i i really wouldn't be able to tell you i think okay. there's i think a lot of people actually think that every player is playing with like some special version of a, of a racket <laughs> that no one ever touches I, as far as i know most people that i'm playing that i've played with that i've trained with just play with the racket they sell um okay custom custom versions of it like sure like in a sense Let of take. like you know it, com it comes already weighted yeah exactly it yeah. comes like already a certain or certain spec but it's not like it's a completely different mold like let's say it's like a racket that weights 320 grams and all of a sudden you're just getting at 340 like without lead tape you know it's a it, it is the mold that, that they sell for most for, for the most part at least most of the people i know have been playing with the racket that that they're selling now typically mm. I, I it takes them a little longer i think to to switch in a sense of like all right maybe you're playing with the the v core 95 and it just a new one just came out they just paint like repaint it so that right. that does happen where they, they kind of stick to it may be a racket for a little bit longer maybe like four years or something but i i i wouldn't say like most players are playing with anything custom i think every everyone's kind of playing with like what they what is being sold with just you know they just ask like oh balance or lead tape here or whatever yeah so i, I don't think it's like this deep conspiracy <laughs> I got you. Yeah, it's great to hear the other side uh, of that. Um, curious, like, do you make modifications to yours? Like, I'm curious, like, what what you do if you make mods? With every racket, I'll add leather grip. Um, that's mm. kind of like a non-negotiable. And got it. Depends. I think, like, for a long time, especially when I had the, the those V Core Pros that I was playing with at the time, whatever they were called, uh, the, the orange one, the, the ones that Stan, Stan won his grandson with. Um, mm. Those ones I didn't mod it at all because the weight was perfect, the balance was perfect. Mm. Um, but usually I, I'll just off feel. I'll be like, ah, oh, maybe I need a little bit extra like weight just for stabilizing the head or something like that. So I had some lead tape, but I'm not one of those guys that's like, you know, looking at the balance to make it a perfect. I, I I don't really like. It's all about feel for me. I'll add some weight and yeah. I'll hit with it. I'm like, oh, this feels right, and that's about it. So. Nothing crazy. A little bit of like the ones that I have right now, the Vcore 95 leather grip. And there's some like weight on, on, I think there's like 10 grams of weight to um, an M3. Oh, and that's interesting. It. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. It's, it's funny. I only recently like kind of experimented with lead tape and I think I put like six grams at three and nine. And I, I don't know. I'm the type of player who like hits with heavy top spin and loves uh, to whip uh, my forehand and all that. So for me, it actually, didn't really work out too well it just seemed like the head was a little too yep. heavy but I, I think maybe what i should have done is like you know counterbalance maybe at the handle um or or something i don't know <laughs> yeah yeah i with i think with more people that have more rack ahead speed it's more about like actually it's some some put some weight on the grip because then you can really pull the racket really mm -hmm. quickly that's what people do they put maybe silicone at the bottom or something uh-huh um, uh-huh but yeah, for me, it's kind of the opposite. I don't really have that much rack ahead speed, so I need kind of the, the stability that I feel like the racket is really plowing through the ball. So in general, I think if you're kind of more plow through kind of player, you want something a bit heavier, if you have a lot of like very whippy shots, something a little bit lighter would be easier. So it's finding that balance. But again, you can it's try and error. You do it. I didn't like it here. Maybe I'll change the position, the weight. Eventually, you'll find something that you like. Yeah, yeah. It's not that's, like that's... a one. Yeah, it's not like a one size fits all kind of thing. Yeah, that's that's encouraging. And so you mentioned that um for you leather grip is non negotiable, and you did mention a little bit about like the you know help with whippy strokes. But why is it non negotiable for you? 
I just just like a feel in the hand. I think okay. it just like I can feel the like the bevels better, and just in general, mm. like it, you know, I I, I feel like they are typically like the normal ones are a little bit too cushiony. Like you just uh, like you kind of can squeeze it a little bit too much, and I feel right. like I can lose my my grip a little bit. Like I, I I like it to feel like you know my my hand is like really on the right spot all the time. So leather grip just makes it a little bit better. Sweet, awesome crew. Thanks for that. So yeah, that was a little detour there. <laughs> yeah, no, appreciate it. So I know in you know juniors, you I think you were something like was it number thirty three in the world? Is that is that right? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, cool, yeah, cool. I so, got to, I got to that night too. Nice, that's awesome. So I mean, how did juniors go for you in general? Were you just like dominating and and also like where were you actually playing? I, I forgot you know what country at the time, but um, because you you are uh, Brazilian, right? Brazilian, yeah. yeah. Yeah, awesome. So I played mostly in Brazil. Um, you know, I I started competing early. You know, like I said like eight nine years old, and I was playing, you know, a lot in my state. Um, you know, I was just kind of state champion for pretty much every age category. Um, but in Brazil, it becomes a lot more national once you start like getting a bit older here. I think here in America, it's a little bit more regional. Um, obviously you play national tournaments, but it, right. for the most part, I see a lot of people just kind of play in their own state in Brazil. Once you kind of get to a certain level, you gotta, you gotta travel a bit around Brazil and, and play tournaments that count for the Brazilian ranking. So early, early in Brazil, like I probably like at 11, 12 year, I was already kind of traveling around the world, uh, around the, around Brazil. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I was always like probably the best in my state and, you know, went on the, the good year, right. The second year of, of, of the, once you're like in Brazil, it, it, like the, the year that you turn, let's say, let's say I, I turned 12, I turned 12 the next year I'm turning 13. I have to play 14. Right. It's not until I, turn 13 here in america it's a little different you play until like your birthday pretty much in that age category right. category so on that first year you're usually playing the older kids so i could be like 12 playing someone who's like you know maybe 14 and a half or something so that, that's a little <laughs> difficult but i was always like you know a good like probably top 15 player in brazil early on as a as a you know 12 13 14 year old by once i started training for like every day which was like 14 15 I kind of had like a big, bigger jump in, in level. And so I finished number one in Brazil, 16th, um, uh, which I had like a good orange bowl at, the, at that year. I remember I qualified, got to the semis. And so that, that kind of pushed awesome. me to number one in Brazil. And then from that point on, just playing, I was already playing some ITFs, like early, like 16s when I was like six. 15, 16, playing some ITFs, like grade fives and stuff. And then after that, it was, you know, just ITF circuit. Uh, we, I was lucky that at the time, Brazil, the Brazilian Federation had a lot of money. So they were able to sponsor sort of like the best Brazilians or, you know, fly stuff like that, not also like help. Because all of a sudden you're traveling around South America and then going to Europe and stuff like that. So I did the whole, you know, ITF circuit, started traveling around the world, you know, played four Grand Slams, didn't, didn't play one of them, but played. Two US Opens, Australia, French, and just did all that. I mean, it's a it's a tough. It's a good preparation for for playing pros. That's for sure. Like you, you're actually on the road like a pro. It's a it's almost like a, an internship to becoming a pro. <laughs> yeah. Um, so True. it was it was it was a good time. Um, and I think God, I feel like I could have gotten a bit higher uh, in terms of of ranking. But uh, you know, I I you know the objective was always to play Grand Slams and and all that and then sort of towards the tail end of my junior career i think that second year of of 18s i didn't do as well as i expected and i started playing some futures as well and i i just sort of burned out i was like i i need something different i i couldn't mm. i couldn't see myself really going to the pros at that point so that's why the kind of college came awesome man um so i, I saw in your bio and you know i remember you talking about some of this i think but you you've beaten uh <laughs> dominic team kyle edmund uh hugo delian uh were those were those juniors or pros or can't remember it was all juniors it was all okay like, i mean team was that one orange ball that i did well i think we played like second second round or third round wow kyle edmund too like was one of the juniors i think in australia in a term in australia i don't remember hugo when it was we played a few times because he was south america so we played right but yeah i you know i grew up with 
those guys, Londero as well. I like, should be Londero. Like he hated me. I beat him like every time. <laughs> the, the matchup, the matchup was just not good. I think he beat me the last time, but I beat him like four or five times before he died. He just did not like me in dinner. It's kind of funny. <laughs> um, so yeah, it just you know you grew up with those guys, and you know just everyone kind of took. I took a different route than most of those guys. So that's just you know that was just the right right thing for me. Yeah. And it, so um, during your junior career, like, did you get to play with any of like the, you know, big time Brazilian, um, you know, pros or anything like that? Like, did, did Guga pop by where you were at all or anything like that? Uh, a little bit. I mean, Guga, Guga has been like, he wasn't that involved in tennis after he retired. He has like okay. he more of like a charity, mm. like Guga Kirtan, like little school for, 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 you know, underprivileged kids and stuff, but he wasn't like coaching or anything like that. So he wasn't gotcha. around as much. It, you know, Bellucci, yes, at the time he was really good nice. around playing. But uh, yeah, there, was, there wasn't that many, you know, got the guys that were like kind of the best Brazilians, they weren't training where I was training. But I did, mm. I mean, I grew up just kind of where I was. There was like a lot of, there was a lot of futures guys and challenger guys. So the training was all those guys pretty much, you know, up until I, I moved to the U.S., Cool, man. Cool. So, yeah, you mentioned UCLA. Um, you know, you got over 100 wins there, which is sick. And you guys reached the team final, I believe, which is amazing. So I guess first off, uh, with what, you know, how, how was the selection process for college? Like, were you like immediately like all oh, UCLA or did you have to pick among some? Uh, no, I, I mean, things when you're, you know, we're not when you don't live here, you don't really know what's like, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. you kind of know the better schools, but uh, you know, you don't really know the difference of a school that is like 15 in the country and a school that is like five in your head is like kind of all the same. So as I was, mm-hmm. you know, going through this process, my coach in Brazil actually played at Georgia. Um, so mm-hmm. we, we want to, I, we, I kind of wanted to go to the university of Georgia at first, but you know, just a timing of things, scholarship, I needed, you know, a lot of scholarship to, to be able to come sure. here. Um, so yeah, we just, you know, started, I mean, I had already a bunch of offers, like, you know, during juniors, you start getting the offers and stuff. Um, but you, you just kind of at the time, like, oh, no, I'm going to play pros, whatever. But eventually, you know, you, you go back into those offers. But as I started, I was talking to, you know, South Carolina for a little bit, but I mm-hmm. actually pretty much committed to Florida State. I think at the time oh. they had a, yeah, they had a, you know, I think a, They've been good for a while, but I think they had like a top 12 team or something. Uh, I think the coach was, the, the dad was Brazilian or something. But yeah, we, we kind of connected. I, I didn't really know best. And I think the timing of things, there was like just some issues with like uh, until the, my SAT scores came and I was a little bit delayed with, you know, going to, to school. So there was like a, a few issues there. So I pretty much committed to go there and I had that we hired to just do transcripts and communication with the schools and stuff like that and he just sent out a bunch of emails kind of last minute like stanford pepperdine ucla right. and i think the timing just worked out ucla i think one guy had just gone pro they had a, the, the, like a scholarship available and you know marcos had, had gone there we, we we knew each other from, mm. from juniors and you know Novikov as well we just knew knew a few guys oh, from wow. juniors and and i you know i think he he asked a couple of the guys, Billy asked a couple of the guys like, you know, about me. And I think Marcos was like, I'll pick up this guy. You're like, he, he's good. Nice. Nice. Um, and they replied, they're like, yeah, we got a spot for you. Like, and uh, I didn't visit. I said, well, I'm coming. That was about it. <laughs> like that was, that was it. I, it was like last second. I, I t- talked to the Florida state coach and I was like, Hey, like, you know, I got the offer from UCLA. I'm just, I'm going to go there. And yeah, I got there like late in the, in the season, like, cause the UCLA's quarter system. So I got there in the last quarter uh, where like, you know, Stevie was still in college and stuff like that. We made the final four that year, but I, I, I didn't play. I registered mm-hmm. that, you know, three months, the team was stacked. And mm-hmm. then, then, then next year, the following year, I, you know, got in, got in the lineup and never left. <laughs> Sick man, that's sick. By the way, Mar- Marcus, I I've seen he's had a pretty good year this year. I, I watched him play against uh, one of my buddies, uh, Ilya Marchenko. I've had on the podcast, yeah. but um, in, in DC. Um, but uh, yeah, there's some great footage of you. I think hitting with him on your your YouTube channel. Maybe there's like a few yeah. of those. Yeah. There's a few. Yeah, there's gonna be another one actually soon. Yeah, Marcus and I. I mean, we're like very good friends. Um, he lives 
nearby me as well here in here in LA. So we, you know, we hang out, we practice, you know, I help him sometimes with, with, you know, things that I see when I watch his matches. So we just help each other. Nice. We just have a good time, you know, and, and, you know, he, he's also, he's awesome at like, you know, coming out and making videos with me and stuff like that. So it's actually like, you know, a really cool, cool thing. So yeah, I'm, I actually like my car is at, at the shop right now and I have his car while he's in Europe. So, <laughs> so shout out. Shout out to Marcus. That's uh, sick, man. Yeah, no, we're really, we're really good friend. Awesome. And how do you pronounce his last name? Is it Giron or how, how do you Giron, say it? Yeah. Giron. Giron. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. He seems like a nice dude for sure. So, oh, yeah, um, he's, he's awesome. yeah. Awesome, man. So what would you say are some of the keys, especially for maybe like some aspiring or current college players? Like, I mean, you obviously like destroyed people and won so much so like what any keys that that you would give um these players to be successful i think college tennis you know i've talked to you know juniors about this and given given a little bit of advice i think it's a lot less about you know actually being like good at tennis it's a it's more a about a like a mindset one there's a mm-hmm. lot more pressure because you're playing for a team yeah. so you you feel it you feel it the responsibility of having to win of you know not wanting to let your teammates down and right I, i've seen a lot of people come into college tennis and crumble um where you know the players that kind of come in and they're good they're you know they're supposed to be like the next big thing on you know whatever our team or other teams and they just couldn't really put it together. They couldn't put it together during college. Even when they played at individual events, they would do well. But like during the, the team thing, they 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 kind of froze. So the advice mm-hmm. is to, you know, any college aspiring college player or even college player, coaches want to see someone who's tough, <laughs> like who is going to battle, who is going to win no matter what. Um, it's a mm-hmm. lot less about you know pretty strokes and good hitting and things like that. Um, it's a lot more about, you know, toughness. You, you just kind of are who you are in terms of your game. I, I remember I had one teammate who like could barely hit a backhand. Uh, he came in my senior year, this kid, Logan Staggs. He was like <laughs> five foot six. Um, but he came in, I was like, this kid, like he's going to win a lot of matches. I knew he was going to win a lot of matches uh-huh. because like he, he had his game, he had his, his game plan. And he would drive people crazy. And and I love that. I love that, you know, the, he wasn't a, a guy that I, I don't think he had any aspirations really of like going pro afterwards, but he could just fight in college. He would drive people bananas. And and that is a, for college players. Like it's not necessarily about playing pretty, about hitting the ball well, about hitting, obviously hitting the ball well, but you know what I'm trying to say? Like not you're not going to win pretty. You're going to have to win ugly sometimes. And I was always good at not giving, you know, I played mostly four, five, six. Um, hmm. I was a wow. huge team player. Like if I wanted to, yeah, I, you know, we obviously we had like stacked teams, but I think, right, right. I, you True. know, through college, I, I, I just wanted us to win a championship. I, I didn't really care about like the individual results uh, as much. Love so, I, you know, if I was going to be a, a lock at four, I'd rather be a lock at four, you know, than, than maybe not sure. be as as com- competent at three or two, whatever. You got to be a team player too. Like if you're coming in, like obviously, like the, the high level juniors are gonna want to, you know, play high and you know win NCAs or whatever. But you know, sometimes you're gonna have to take one for the team, and you you need to be able to do that, you know, for your teammates, for for everyone else, but. It is. There's a lot more mental. It's 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 a tough game. It's you know it's completely different than what we used to. You know, coming in like you just play individually all the time. So you got to be tough about that. And you you know you got to come in you know ready to go to war with these guys. And it, it seems again it seems a little cliche, but it's a lot more mental than anything. Like I think the guys that we you that I played that I had trouble with, it wasn't necessary because they were made the best tennis players maybe they were just like really tough and you knew it was going to be a battle so in your own way like i was i seemed like a relaxed guy when i was playing but like i was like there's no way i'm losing to any of this freaking guy so <laughs> um you, yeah i mean you have to put it in your head that you just you're just not going to lose to any of them yeah um, and you're just you know there's a pride that goes into it um so 
it's mostly toughness. It's mostly just embracing that. Yeah, I'd love to dive deep into that a little more if possible. So like, so you get the mindset first, like, you know, I'm not going to lose this person. And then what else does it take? Because, you know, there could be, you know, somebody like I could just go against somebody and just like say to myself, oh, yeah, I'm not going to lose. But maybe you don't really necessarily believe it. And then I don't know. Is there other stuff too, like uh, that you got to do afterwards to truly nail that like in your mind so that it then goes towards like what you put out on the court? Well, I think. You know, tennis just in in general, right? Like, I think a lot of match, most matches are won before they even start, right? Like, you, you yeah. get on the court. You, very rarely, you're you're playing. You're either playing someone who is like worse than you technically, like you know, sort of speaking, or maybe better than you. Very rarely, you just like ride at like a very level match. So there's always a battle of like you know the guy who is like technically should be losing the match to get himself to like maybe win that match. So, you know, as I was playing four, five, I definitely like, I, I thought that I was like better than most of the guys that were playing aside from, you know, USC and, and, and Virginia at the time, Baylor too, that those uh-huh. are the teams, but very few teams that I, I'd be like, okay, there's going to be someone around my level at four or five. Right. So I, I always played the way, you know, I, I, I always tell people if you're playing someone like lower than your level, the, the key is to like, because a lot of people have a hard time actually playing lower, oh, lower yeah. level. Yeah. If you, if, if they already kind of struggle believing that they're going to win that match and you kind of come in like on it and you, you hopefully get a break early or you, you go up early, then it's pretty much match. Then at that point, you're just administering. So if you're up like 4 1, 4 0, whatever. And this guy already kind of came in, not really believing believing he's going to win. Right. Um. You you already put yourself in a good situation. The, the, the worst thing you can do, if you especially if you're playing lower level, it's you know you you stay one one two two three three four four like just <laughs> kind of playing to the their pressure. level, and they they're like, and they are all of a sudden they're like, oh, I can they you know, maybe I can squeeze this one out. So it's again, it's a lot a lot more mental than anything. Um. But you know I. I it's tennis. You can tell yourself that you're the best, and and we maybe it, it, the guy is just playing lights out that day. It, it it's just you got to come into the match, solve solve the problems, and you know find the the weaknesses and explore that as as best as you can. Like I mean, there's there's no real real secret. It's just um you know imposing yourself. Get a, get up early if you can, and 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 you know crush the roof. I think that's always the a really important thing. And once you feel that, once you feel like they don't really believe anymore, like you, you should be okay. Gosh, grew awesome. And then, um, you know, I do get a lot of questions about people struggling where like they'll win the first set or they're up like four, one, five, one. And then like, they just like mess up and you know, the, their opponent comes back. So any advice on how to keep uh, the pedal on the metal, so to speak? I mean, I think keep it simple. It's, it's always a, is a good thing. I think all of a sudden, sometimes you're at, you know, serving for the match and you think you have to, hit winners or the, the the game plan like if you got to the point where you're serving for the match or you're a five one or you know you won the first set and you're up in the second set if you got to that point like why would you change anything unless they all of a sudden have made an incredible adjustment but i, I right it's usually <laughs> on, on your record right so i i just you know stay the course like continue to do the 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 things that were working and be patient and go for the shots that you do truly trust. Don't go for anything like silly in, in because all of a sudden I have to finish with a bunch of winners or something. Yeah. Just at that point, like play completely to your own strengths, protect your weakness a little bit more. You know I mean? Don't go for anything crazy. Let's say you're back in his worst. Why would you go for maybe a back and winner at that point? That's all they want to do. Like try to control the, the emotions but yeah i mean it, it, it's it's also like experience you know putting yourself in that situation i think people think that it doesn't happen to anyone else like if i'm serving for a match i still like today feel it you know you still like oh, yeah. it's, it's, like, that emotion is just you got to normalize it it's like just because you're feeling it doesn't mean that that all of a sudden you can't play anymore you know what i mean you, if you're just feeling those those little butterflies whatever they're then you know it is what it is you gotta you just gotta be able to play through it and because again everyone feels 
you know, just tell yourself that it's, it's okay to feel that way and, and go from there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, I mean, any other things that you do to, um, like, calm your nerves down? Like, do you have a particular ritual in between points or, you know, anything you think about uh, in particular? I think I'm, breathing is a very, very important, I think, you would remember to, like, hopefully, like, slow your breath down. And, and that usually, like, calms me down. I yeah. I don't really have any rituals besides, you know, your normal go to the towel, like, Try to like not rush through it. You know, sometimes you want to near near the finish line. You kind of want to rush through it a little bit. I think that's an important thing. Controlling like the tempo, man, maintaining like your routine. Um, but I think all of that is just very personal. I, I, I mm -hmm. you, I think my advice is like s seek what works for you. I think a lot of people are trying to find, you know, some some magic way of doing it, and it's like you, you just kind of have to find your own way. I think, you know, for me, I've always been. You know, I, I actually like end up like distracting myself sometimes from the moment. Like I'll be watching maybe mm -hmm. another match next to me or something and just kind of like not trying to like think too much. It's like, oh, this is a huge moment. Just sort of like relax and like, let's go play the next point. But it is point by point. I think people like eventually they, they start, you know, they see the finish line and they the, their mind goes in in a weird direction of like oh what if i choke some like i think my advice to people too is like stop using the word choke like mm. people say like choke way Very too negative too often like but yeah. all the time like you oh i'm you lose like a game that was I, I hear this in junior sometimes like you know it's like you lose a game that was 40 15 it's like oh what a choke i'm like what are you talking about like you're still in the <laughs> middle of the match you know what i mean so like stop, <laughs> those negative things yeah. is never gonna yeah. like really really help you and people are so scared of the choke and so scared of uh you know especially in juniors like what their you know peers are gonna think and stuff like that it's like don't, don't worry yeah. about those things it's like it's, it's your own thing and we all choked we've all done it like i've you know what i mean like i've you know i lost a match point on a semi-final of ncaa's once you know we, we end up losing that match so four three so it's like it happens you know what i mean it just happens yeah. so but i gotta find your own like strategy breathing is very important i've gotten into that recently and trying to slow down your breathing and heart rate it's it, it really pays dividends yeah a lot of great stuff there yeah it's 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 i wish i could go back in time like most of us do you know like in juniors i remember just at one point you know always thinking like oh like you know if i lose to this person everybody will think you know x about me and all that and it was just just mm -hmm. lame thinking about it mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter i know um, I, I i i wish i you could go back like that as well. It would be like much easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's normal getting wiser as you age. Um. So, so yeah. I mean, in terms of the uh, the pro tour, I mean, how was the uh, how was the transition? Was it like a pretty rough go around in the beginning, or did you just like get your first point like in the first tournament? Like, how did that go for you? Well, <laughs> so I I had points before I came to college, and oh, then nice. you know, obviously I didn't play. Um, I, during college, I totally coasted. I didn't want to play pros. I just wanted to play college tennis. So I never played like any events after you in 2016, I actually like quit. Um, I, I didn't want to play pros. I started working at Pepperdine as a volunteer coach for a year. Um, but I, you know, my, my senior year was definitely my best season in terms of like level. I was playing really well. So I, I got out of college playing well, but mentally not ready to to play pro still. I just like, you know, going through things and I just didn't want to, I really didn't want to do it. I was thinking like, you know, money wise, how am I going to do this? And I just right. you know, didn't want to do it. So I was at Pepperdine for, for a season and, you know, I was hitting a lot with the guys, obviously. Um, and I played, I was living in Calabasas. I played a Calabasas future at the time and I actually got to like the quarterfinals. I beat the two seed. I qualified, got to the quarterfinals you know, lost to Clun in a tough match. So I was like playing, yeah. I was like, I was like playing lights out. I was crushing all the guys on the team. And, you know, eventually the season ended and I kind of had to, you know, do I really want to go the college route or coaching route or whatever, or like, do I go back to like playing? I, I didn't give myself a shot. So I just kind of made the decision of going into pros. I was like, let's, let's do it. Let's, um, you know, use the summer, play a bunch of matches, played a bunch of men's open, made, made some money, you know, got a lot of matches in, got confident. And I started, you know, I was living down here in the South Bay in, in Los Angeles, training at Carson a little bit. And, 
and I start, I was like, oh, let's start in this. There was like this three California tournaments, like Claremont, uh, Laguna Niguel, and Fountain Valley. They, they used to have every September or August, September. I was like, oh, I'll start there. You know, I don't have to travel. It's not expensive. I'll see what happens, see how I'm feeling. So I, I played Claremont, which was a, uh, Claremont was my first tournament back, like for real. Um, and I was playing qualifiers. So it's four rounds of qualifying. <laughs> um, and I qualified, got the number one seed. Um, and I was like, oh, great. This guy, Chris O'Con- O'Connell now, that he's like, I think it's like one, 140, one, 130 in the world at the time. He was like 300. I was like, damn, I'm like first match, you know, four matches of qualifiers to play the, the one seed. <laughs> and then won the match uh, in two Sick. sets and then, and then won the tournament. <laughs> You're ready. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, won that match. I think I got to like a walk over the next round, and eventually, you know, beat a few guys and played uh, my my teammate Marty Redlicky in mm-hmm. the finals. That was a battle. I think I won like six three in the third. Wow! And then I was like, well, I you know, I guess I have to do this, right? And, you know, so I went from you know, I had a few a couple points from that Calabasas tournament, but you know, I immediately got up where I you know was pretty close to 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 most main draws um but yeah i you know won that tournament then we got to the court of had to actually couldn't play the following week because there was too many special exempts so i actually couldn't play the singles of the following week had to wait uh. play qualities of the third week which was bs <laughs> yeah um, after you're winning the it was to- totally bs and then i qualified got to the quarterfinals and then like kind of pulled my back because my body uh, was like what are you so doing so many matches like, I was, yeah yeah, it was too many matches. I because I won singles, doubles in Claremont, and I was in the quarterfinals wow. and finals of doubles of Fountain Valley. So I Jeez. went on like a just crazy like streak, <laughs> and then my body was like, "Dude, you you're not ready for this." Like, you know? <laughs> so but yeah, then you know I pros. It, it was a I was you know if I had gone at at, a, at eighteen like a lot of my my peers in Brazil and played pros, I think I would have probably quit at twenty. Like, I don't know. I don't think I would have made like two years on the tour. Um, but now, you know, after college, after kind of having all that and the experience and still feeling like at 24, 20, 20 I think at 24 when I was playing 25, um, feeling pretty young. So it's young for today's age on tour. So, you know, I played, I was playing free, having a good time, enjoying my time on tour, even though like I didn't, you know, end up spending that much time playing, but. Uh, it was really, it was really fun. Awesome, man. Awesome. So, um, as far as like lessons learned, like while, while playing that you've maybe, you know, taught others and everything like uh, from the tour, like what, what were the biggest lessons that you learned? It is the tour is it's a mental battle, man. It's, it's really difficult to, to, you know, especially financially, you, you, you're struggling to, yeah. to travel and, you know, pay bills and, and things like that. Uh, mentally it's, it's really tough. And, he, and I think that, you know, I won three futures and I yeah. think all of them I won because mentally I was at a, in a really good space. Um, whatever that means, uh, why would that happen? It's still like, I still need to work on figuring it out so I can like, you know, hopefully preach it to, to, to my players and stuff. But it was always, there was a, there was a, you know, a, a presence to, to, you know, those weeks where I wasn't worried too much about, you know, the next flight, the next, mm-hmm. whatever you're just playing. And, you know, I, the tour, like I said, it, it is mentally draining, mentally exhausting. you got to find ways to, that's your home pretty much, right? You're, tra- you're traveling all the time. You're playing all the time. You have to find ways to almost like feel like you're at home, even on the road. And I think that is my, my main takeaway. I think it, it, we, I'm a very realistic guy um, to, to, I think some, sometimes to a fault. And I think like you can stay out there and, you know, hopefully, you know, dream, you can make it and play, 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 play. Well, realistically, you know, very few few guys make it through and girls make it through. Um, so you have to kind of, you know, I think being present and you have your goals, but being present in the weeks that you're playing, just sort of like not looking necessarily at a an end of the journey. Like I have to get to top 100. That's the end of the journey. It's like, mm-hmm. I, you know, the 
kind of enjoying the the journey there, the path there. And I think that's sometimes I I struggle with that a lot. I was like, you know, be playing a future and you know, you lose second round and you make no money or go play some challengers, you're losing the qualities at the time and you you're you're down two two grand and you're just like in your head like, why the hell am I doing this? Mm. You know what I mean? And you know, you gotta you gotta fight that. I think like, you know, today obviously there's a lot of emphasis in, you know, men, the mental aspect of you know, right. mental health and everything like that. And and the tour is definitely not a, not a place where I think mental health in general, like, like thrives as a collective, like, you know, you're alone a lot or, you know, obviously you have friends and stuff, but you know, you're, you're there, like we're all like technically enemies. So, <laughs> um, so it's, it's just a difficult thing. You have to like, you just be, if you're going to play pros, no matter what your level is, like if, if you're going to make it or not, you have to be mentally ready for it because it, it can it can really be difficult. So you know, work on that. <laughs> however, you can do it. However, however way you can you can work on your mental side of your game. I think that that's really important. All right. I really hope that you enjoyed my interview with Karu Sell and Karu. Thanks a lot for coming on to the show. And we will hear from you and myself again for the next episode. But definitely encourage you to check out MyTennisHQ.com and also search MyTennisHQ on YouTube. And we will list all the other links that we mentioned to Karu and uh, MyTennisHQ's various social media pages in the show notes, as well as the books that he mentioned, probably with some stars in place of uh, the F word. (laughs) But anyways... uh, Actually, I don't know if you even heard that yet on this first half, but uh, I will still list the links, the uh, books that he mentioned, which are really from the second part of the interview. But regardless, thanks a lot for listening. And I do want to leave you with a quote, as I often love to do at the end of the show. And this one is by Frank Peretti. And Frank said, don't be perfect, just keep getting better. Love that quote. And also, uh, which I usually say before the quote of the day, is that I would really appreciate it if you would leave a review for the Tennis Files podcast. And I believe that we are at 99 ratings. So uh, it would be cool if you got us to over 100. So I definitely would really, really appreciate that. And that is it for this week. So thanks a lot. And again, uh, if you enjoyed this episode, then definitely tune in to my episode next week with Karu for part two, uh, where we'll hear a lot about his tournament experiences and practicing with Naomi Osaka, what Naomi is really like, and developing strategies and tactics for your game, as well as um, hitting better returns and a lot of other great tips. Alrighty then. Well, thank you for listening. And until next time, this is Mirabhan Aranshad signing out. 